Our scripture reading is from 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 17. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free. You're not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. You may be seated and we can dismiss our children or child. Good morning. Sweet time, sweet time of worship and song. You know, a lot of times, and I'd, I'd say probably most of the time, we think of worship as just music and just song, but the truth is, is that in a relationship with Christ, we're in a place of worship all the time. And so our whole service here together is corporate worship from beginning to end, and it's exciting to, uh, to be together knowing that you as the church come together with meet more of the church. And the church as a whole is worshiping God. It's a beautiful, a beautiful time. If you have your Bibles, if you'll open to Galatians chapter 5, we'll pick up where we left off last week uh, at verse 7. And our title this week is Liberty Through Love. Liberty Through Love. Father, we love you. And we thank you. We, we just thank you so much, Lord, that you loved us and you pour your spirit into us, Lord. And we can, through loving you first, we know, we know that you teach us to love one another. And Lord, we thank you for the liberty you give us. We thank you for the freedom that you give us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's all guided by your spirit. We just receive all that you have for us this morning. Open our ears. Let us hear what your word has to say to our hearts this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 7. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. But he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Now, last week, our message was titled, No U-Turn. When you're in a relationship with Christ and you receive the freedom, there's no U-Turn to go back into bondage. There's no place for us to say, I want to go back. And in the churches here in Galatia, that's what was going on. They, they, they had the freedom through the gospel of Jesus Christ that planted the church, that was planted into their hearts. And then men came in and tried to persuade them, no, that's, that's not enough. You've got to go back under the Mosaic Law. You've got to come back. You've all got to be circumcised and all of these things. But, but in Christ, in our relationship with him, there's no U-turn. So continuing with that theme, Paul tells them, he says, you ran well. You ran well. Now, and, and the way you can interpret that is it's past tense. He's not saying you're running well. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, this is one of several references to running a race. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, do, not, do, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And 2 Timothy 4, 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now all of these references have the common thread, obviously, of, of running a race, but it's really a common thread of endurance. It's endurance. That's what's going to win the race. Your speed and your energy is great, but if you don't have the endurance to carry you to the end, then a lot of times you're running in vain. And you want to make sure that you are prepared for the race that you're in. And as believers, we have to prepare ourselves for the long run. It's not sprinters for Christ. Because when you get into a sprint, you burn out real quick. And even in relay races, you run extremely fast, but then you hand that baton off because you can't keep that pace. 
on your own. You have to have others that will help. And also, many prize fighters are, are really good, and they eliminate their competition in the first round or two because they know how to land those punches. But if they're ever into a fight where someone can take the punch, they have to go into round four or round five, and they begin to lose their endurance. And a lot of times those prize fighters don't do well in the later rounds because they're not prepared for it. They're prepared for their opponent going down in the first round. Muhammad Ali was that way. Muhammad Ali, he honestly didn't win his fights because he was a better fighter. He, went, he won his fights because he could take a punch better than a lot of other people could, and the other guys would wear out. By the time the fight was over, he would win. Now, that, you may argue that point. He claimed to be the best fighter in the world. There were many fighters that are good fighters, but the point of what we're making here is that there has to be endurance. We have to have effort that we put forth on the front end to really div dive in to our relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't come with a casual workout. You can't just get up, do a couple exercises of prayer, you know, maybe read a scripture or two and go off and expect that that's going to be every day. It's going to be your endurance. You've got to have that time with the Lord. You've got to have the time alone with Him, the time in the Word. You've got to be able to hear and listen when the Holy Spirit speaks because here's another issue that happens when you're in a race. You might want to go out too fast. And I've seen that happen. Our son ran cross country. And when he would run uh, track as well, he would sometimes want to take off in front of the pack. And his coaches would say, you need to, you know, slow down on that front end because you've got the long haul. You've got to finish it. So, you know, that was a, that was a good, uh, good reference to coaching is that you don't want to burn it all out in the, first, in the first few minutes. But it takes effort. It takes hours of training. It takes vigorous repetitions. It's painful. It's physically painful when you're actually training for something that you want to accomplish. You know, the old saying, no pain, no gain. I always used to say, no pain, well, no pain. <laughs> it worked better for me, of course, <laughs> you see the results. <laughs> it's painful, it's exhausting, but those who want to finish, those who want to win, go through this training every day. They do it every day. Now let's compare that to our spiritual walk. Do we spend, it, spend as much time working out in the spirit so that our flesh begins to die? See, this is the real key to uh, walk with Christ is that our flesh needs to be dying. And the only way our flesh dies is when we actually force it into submission. When we ourselves submit to the spirit, our flesh then has to die. Do we study God's word? Do we spend time with him in prayer, asking, seeking, and knocking with the same effort that we put into other things of life. 1 Timothy 4, 8 says, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. We need to exercise our mind and our spirit as well as our body. We need to be disciplined in our walk with the Lord. Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us, and He definitely gives us the, the conviction and the ability to see things coming. But the more that we dive into the Word and the more that we spend time with the Lord, the more alive the Spirit is to us. He's as alive as He's going to be. But our ears are not always tuned in because we've got all the other things that are distracting us. But when we're focused on Him, we're focused on the Word, and we're focused on the Lord, then what happens is we're able to hear clearly what the Holy Spirit is, is directing us to do, what the Holy Spirit is guarding us from. And then as far as ministry goes, He then leads us to where He wants us to be involved, not just because there's a need, not just because you want to do something, not just because you think you have a talent to do something, but because the Holy Spirit is placing you in that place to accomplish what you need to accomplish in that moment. And he wants to accomplish that through you. And Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Many times you will hear people say, I don't know what God's will for my life is. Well, they're not looking in the moment. They're, they're, they're kind of looking 
for the future when that comment is made. If you're looking for the moment and where we're supposed to be today, today is a day of salvation. Today is a day that we have a relationship with the Lord. We need to be looking at today. What is the will of God for me today? Well, it's to spend time with Him. It's to be in His Word. It's to be in relationship with Him. It's to listen to the Holy Spirit. That is the will of the Lord. And by doing that, He then will direct your steps. And the question of what is the next part of the will of God for my life will be revealed the closer we are to Him. That's the purpose of our relationship with Him. And this is how important the gospel is that we're hearing today. We need to ask ourselves, do we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is absolute? Do we believe it's truth? And are we willing to discipline and commit ourselves to it? According to Paul, the gospel is absolute truth, and Scripture confirms it. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and what? Truth. And John 8.32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now there are many, many verses speaking of God's word being the truth and being true. And the churches in Galatia, they once believed this gospel wholly to be true. And now they're being turned. They're being pulled away. Someone came in, persuaded them otherwise. And Paul tells them this is not from the one who called them. Who's the one that called them? It's the Lord himself. We're called by Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit touches our hearts when our hearts are prepared to receive the the call. And when that happens, we become followers of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ who calls us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the gospel is preached, the Spirit of God brings those whose hearts are ready. Call is not from man. And see, that's the thing that Paul over and over and over in his writings would tell people, you know, I'm called by God as an apostle. Man did not appoint Paul. God appointed him, and it's the same way in our life today. We're not saved because of man. We're saved because the word of God, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, was preached. A man used his voice, but God used his spirit to touch the heart of the man, not the man himself. There are many eloquent speakers. There are many people who can say the right things and and, and put it in the best way possible. But if the Holy Spirit is not moving, it's just words. Beautiful words, but just words. It's very important that we, that we, we understand this and grasp this. Otherwise, we begin to look at smooth talk and uh, individuals <coughs> and practice, rehearse speeches as the one who saves people. Man can save no one. If he could, he would be able to save himself. And what man can say they can save someone else when they know they can't save themselves? It's all through the power of God. It's through Jesus Christ. This is what happened in the churches in Galatia. And I see it, in a sense, it's happening a lot today. There's a lot of time that there are beautiful words and eloquent speeches given and thousands of people may be coming, but if they're not hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, there are thousands of people that are sitting there and who knows if any of them really understand what it means to have a relationship with Jesus, lest he be taught. We can't move away from the word. We can't move away from the truth. We can't move away from what the Bible teaches. We have to stay firm in our walk because otherwise we will be tripped up by those who come out with eloquent speeches. We need to have the discernment. Where, the discern- where does discernment come from? It comes from the Lord. It comes from the Spirit. It comes from the Word of God. Otherwise, it's just men looking at men rather than the truth of the gospel. And Paul goes on to say that a little, a little leaven levels the whole lump. Uh, leavens the whole lump. Unleavened bread... It's basically uh, bread without yeast. You can't add the tiniest bit of yeast into the dough or the whole lump is affected. Everything is affected by it. You can't just do a dab. You can't do it. And honestly, on the other side of that, if you just put a dab of God's Word in your life, 
you're still not going to be as effective as you should be. It will be there, and God will still use that when it comes time, but you need more. You need to be more in, the, in a walk with the Lord. But you can't add yeast to bread without it affecting the whole loaf. And spiritually speaking, leaven is a spiritual untruth or heresy that affects the entire body of Christ. And once something is spoken and planted in a, as a seed in the body of Christ, if there's no discernment, if there's no wisdom, if there's not the Word of God being taught, then how are people to know that the, what they're hearing is true or not true? We have to be very uh, discerning, especially in the day, because all of culture is coming against the church. Our culture is coming in wave after wave, and the media is behind it, wave after wave, pushing uh, the culture over Christianity. And many Christians today are in fear because, well, I can't say this or I can't do that because I will be blasted, I will be whatever. We need to stand firm in the Word of God no matter what and not worry about what happens. Who's our protector? It's not the government. It's not the media. It's not the people. So even if you want to go along with them, you're not going to be protected. You're going to be turned on. We need to be sound in our doctrine. We need to be sound in the Word. We need to be sound in our walk. So therefore, if we do find ourselves with a culture against us, we stand by the power of God, not on our own strength. And what did, what did Jesus tell his disciples? He said, when this time comes, some of you will be persecuted, some of you will be put into prison, but don't worry or don't fear what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will give you the words that you need when you need them. That's who we need to be be bold as. We need to be bold as lions. We need to be bold in the Word and understand that Jesus Christ will give us the strength that we need. This is why we impress upon everyone to read and study God's Word. And this is the only way to make sure that the untruths and the heresies can't make their way into the church. There will always be those who try to worm their way in. Scripture tells us about that. In 2 Peter Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And 1 John two eighteen says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know, that is, the last hour. And Second John 1, 7-8 says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose the things that we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Paul makes it clear that whoever this deceiver is, he will receive his due judgment. And that's going to happen. God will bring down judgment upon the false teachers and the false prophets. Romans 13, 2 says, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment upon themselves. And 2 Peter 2, 12 says, But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. So we need to be careful. We need to be prepared. We need to be in the long race. We need to be praying for endurance. Pray for patience. Nobody wants to do that. We've talked about that. Pray for it anyway. Because I promise you, if you pray for patience, whatever God brings into your life, we're, it may not be comfortable, but it will be effective. And it will produce fruit. And you will be able to go through that, through the hand of God, through Him walking you through the process of whatever He's bringing in your life. You will go through that because He's carrying you through it. And when you do go through it, you will have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. He will guard your heart and minds. And when you come out of that situation, God will have strengthened you and emboldened you to where you can say, Therefore, had it not been for Jesus Christ, I wouldn't have made it through that but we have the power and the strength of the Lord within us. It's very, very important that we be prepared. We don't want to find ourselves easily persuaded by a well-presented lie. 
And you know, the people that tell the well-presented lies, they tell them long enough they believe them themselves. And there's a lot of lies out there today. And we have to stand on God's Word as being completely and totally true, not taking what we want, not picking and choosing and leaving the hard stuff on the table. We take it as it says it. We believe it as it's written. We write it upon the table of our heart, and we move forward in our relationship because of it. Let the Word of Truth be our standard and our foundation. Now, verses 11 through 15, actually 11 through 12 here. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. And Paul makes an excellent point here. If those of the circumcision, they're the ones that are bringing this persecution upon him, if he were still preaching what they're preaching, then why would they be persecuting him? The persecution is coming because he is no longer preaching what they're preaching. He's preaching freedom in Jesus, not being bottled up, not being uh, enslaved again. If he were still preaching the law, he would not be under this persecution. Paul's whole message changed on the road to Damascus. He was preaching circumcision. He was preaching law. He was preaching it very well because he knew it very well. And he was trained very well. And he went out preaching it. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. The only thing that didn't change in Paul was his zeal. He was zealous now for the Lord instead of for the law. He was zealous for Jesus instead of for religious uh, you know, practices. And that's who Paul became. From legalism to freedom, all because of what Jesus did on the cross. And Paul calls what Jesus did on the cross, he calls it the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross. And Romans 9.33 says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Jesus is a stumbling stone for the law, for those who want to follow the law and be in bondage to legalism. Jesus is a stumbling stone for those who don't accept him, who don't receive him, who want to walk out their life the way they want to, who want to live according to their plan. Jesus is a stumbling stone. He is an offense. He brings offense to this world because he stands against this world. He came into the world, but those he came to didn't receive him. They didn't believe him. We as believers now are not offended by the word of God. We're not offended by what Jesus did. We are grateful for what Jesus did. We have a wonderful, wonderful relationship with God because of what Jesus did. So there's no offense to the believers, but to the non-believers, there's offense because he stands against selfishness. He stands against self-indulgence. He stands against sin that man doesn't even want to recognize is sin because, well, I'm not hurting anybody. If I practice this, who's it hurting? It's hurting everyone around you, not just yourself. When you're practicing sin, when you're living in sin, you may not see it right now, but the effect that it has bubbles out of you onto all of those around you. And you can't, you can't control that. You may think you're in control. You're doing this, nobody else is affected, but that is a lie. When we fall into sin and we practice sin, it affects everyone around us. But it's an offense to tell you that if you're walking in this sin. If you're following this sin, you want to do this sin, it feels good, I don't want to get rid of this, I don't want to get, be away from this, then it's an offense when Jesus says, but it's sin. And sin sometimes need to be talked about. We need to talk about sin. It's there. It's in front of us. And we, even though we are Christians and believers and walk with the Lord, we still struggle with it because we have this fleshly tent that we can't shake. We die a little each day. And we die to ourselves more and more that we spend time with the Lord. But this sin, this sin uh, around us still affects us as believers. If it didn't, 
then as soon as you were a Christian, then you wouldn't be affected by anybody else around you. But how many of you today, if I were to say, if somebody really bugged you, boom, somebody popped in your head. Somebody popped in your head. Something happened. Something was, it registered because all of a sudden you realize, yeah, so-and-so, they really bug me. Or this situation at work really bothers me. Well, why does it bother you? Is it affecting your spiritual life? Is it affecting your, is it, is it affecting your walk in the Lord? Well, it is when you're focused on it. It is when you're walking in unforgiveness. It is when you're not seeking the Lord and letting Him be your guide through these situations and in relationships. That's the difference uh, between the world and between walking with Christ. We forgive. We move on. We don't let it be, bury into our hearts and, and, and spring up as bitterness, which will defile many, as the Scripture teaches us. We have to be continually, moment by moment, laying that fleshly part of ourselves down. Today, it seems as though everyone is finding reason to be offended. I mean, how many news articles or reports, oh, such and such group was offended, this group was offended, that group was offended, that offends me, this offends me, whatever. The world wants to be offended, but the true offense they want to stay away from. The one who is offended them is the one who stands as judge. They don't want to hear that. So a word here, a word there, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm offended by that. That bothers me. Political correctness is all the rage today, and everyone is tiptoeing around trying to keep the peace. But you notice all the tiptoeing? There's less peace today than there's ever been. Political correctness has not brought peace. It's brought more division because truth is not spoken into it. And if you're not speaking truth into a political situation or a, a cultural situation, then everybody still tiptoes around it, but they're all mad at one another. And most of the time, they're mad at themselves. Jesus doesn't tiptoe. His feet are planted, solid. And when he speaks, when he walks, when he talks, it comes forth in power, not tiptoeing, not cowering away, but speaking truth. He always did. Even to the enemy, when Satan took him out there and they were going through that desert, what did Jesus do? Did he argue with Satan? No, he just spoke the word. Everything that came at Jesus, he spoke the word. That's what we should be doing, speaking the word. Don't let our emotions get in the way. Don't be driven by our emotions. Be driven by the Spirit of God. Jesus is not, he doesn't tiptoe around, and his word is not politically correct. And I'm proud to say it. The Word of God is not politically correct. Hallelujah! May it never be. Many are offended by Him and His Word, but we as Christians, we need to align ourselves with it. We need to align ourselves with God's Word. We need to take it as truth. Even those hard things that we don't understand, we still by faith say, God, I don't understand some of this in Your Word, but I know that You are God and I trust You with it, so therefore I believe. And we stand on that, and we walk in that. Not in fear, not in timidity, but in boldness. I remember John the Baptist, when he was in prison, he had some doubts. And he sent word, you know, is this the one? I mean, he just baptized him not too long before that. He knew who he was, but he was in fear. He was about to die, and he probably knew he was about to die. And he just really wanted that affirmation. Is this the one? Jesus sent this word to him to encourage him. In Luke 7, 22 through 24, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now, that's words going to a dying man. It's our word today. Blessed are you. Blessed am I that we walk in his word and we're not offended because of him. Let those around us be offended. I'm okay with that. You don't trust God? I'm sorry to hear that. Let me tell about Jesus. You don't want to hear about Jesus? I'm sorry you're offended, but I love him and I'm standing with him. Stand in boldness. And I encourage you this morning not to shy away from the truth of God's Word. 
Don't be afraid. Don't walk in fear to share the truth with other people. And if you're walking with the Lord and you're, you are uh, in that relationship, in that closeness, and you're listening, He will give you the guidance of who and when to speak. We're not always to speak the word to certain people. God may not want us to speak to that person. We should be ready in season and out of season. But be prepared to speak truth when you speak. And be prepared to listen. I think that's probably the most important thing. And, um, and it's even said it's better to listen you know, than, to, than to speak. We, should, we have two ears. You know, someone once said, you know, we have two ears and one mouth. You should be listening twice as much. Unfortunately, a lot of times, and I, I put myself in this category, I find myself talking a little more than I should. Some of you guys saying, yeah, on Sunday morning, absolutely, <laughs> you do. But we are speaking of what, what is true, and we want to continue to talk about what is true. But more importantly, we want to listen to the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. We want to be prepared to speak to those who God calls us to speak to. If you believe in Jesus, then you have to believe in His Word. There's no option there. Amen. You can't say, well, I believe Jesus is my Lord but I don't believe everything the Bible says, then you've got a problem. There's a problem in registering truth with truth because Jesus is truth. His word is truth. You can't separate the two. And so we have to understand that. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in his word, and you're not to be ashamed to share it. Romans 1 16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is, this is the Apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew and also for the Greek. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How can we divide the word of truth rightly? Only when we're in relationship with the Lord and we're seeking Him and we're putting Him first in our lives and we're allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us and through us. And Mark 8.38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I think probably one of the saddest things is to think about standing before Jesus and he being ashamed because you didn't do, you didn't walk, you didn't speak, you didn't believe like you said you did. See, talk is cheap. And all of us can say, I believe. Yes, I believe. But then you face a situation and you cower back. You don't move forward. You don't plug through. We are to be consistent in our walk and consistent in our relationship. Now back to our text. Paul makes a strong statement toward those who are bringing this trouble upon the church. In verse 12, he says, I wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Now, for some, this verse simply means to cut themselves off from the church, meaning that they would leave and not come back. And that's a good explanation for that. Yeah, absolutely. We don't want to bother. We don't want them here messing the church with the church, stirring up problems. They should be gone, but they just leave. But the Greek wording implies a much more harsh interpretation. And the Greek word for cut off is a kapatu. That means to amputate. Reflexively, or by irony, to mutilate the private parts. Paul is saying very forcibly, if these men are so bound up in legalism of circumcision and they have turned the church away from the freedom that they have in Jesus Christ, he wishes they would not stop at circumcision but go all the way and castrate themselves. And that's not an easy teaching. But that's what, that's what these words mean. This is how deep this is. And I know it's a sensitive topic, but Paul is not pulling any punches. This is how how concerned he is for the body of Christ that they not get pulled back away from the truth of the gospel. This is how zealous he is for the gospel. And anything or anyone who tries to take the church and move them away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is how he looks at it. He doesn't want 
us in bondage. The Lord doesn't want us back in bondage. And again, we've talked about this in our last study. The bondage of legalism is primarily what we're talking about here, meaning that we have to go back and do and practice the things of the law in order that our salvation is fulfilled. That's not what the Bible teaches. But it also refers to not going back to the sin, not going back to the bondage of sin that ensnared us before we also came to understand and walk in the relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we have freedom. God gives us tremendous amount of freedom walking with Him. Paul said, you know, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are, are best for me. Not all things should I do. And there are many things that our freedoms can do that can get us in trouble. So we have to be careful. And particularly, if we've been delivered from a sin, but we are now in grace, we have to make sure that we don't let that sin creep back in so that grace will abide over it over and over and over and over again. We've got to come to a place to understand it's still sin. And we need to walk into grace, but we need to walk in humility and never come to the point to where we call sin other than what it is because of our freedom, because of the grace that we have. It's, it's so uh, difficult in this world we're faced. We discussed this in the men's group yesterday. This world is just, it's just coming at us. And we as men and as women have to stand firm and ask the Holy Spirit for that wisdom to turn us away from what comes at us so that we don't find ourselves back into a pattern or a habit. And it's so easy to do because it's, it's one little lie. Oh, it won't hurt to just look at that. It won't hurt to just one time. It won't hurt to, you know, that won't pull me back into bondage again. But it will. And that's the thing that we have to come to the understanding of is that in our freedom, we are free because of Jesus Christ. We turn away from Him, our freedom goes with it. We've got to remain with Him. Now, verses 13 through 15. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. The liberty we have in Jesus is an awesome thing. It's wonderful to be able to wake up in the morning and say, Thank you, Jesus, for this freedom you've given me. Amen. Thank you, Lord, that I can worship you, that I'm not bound up in the sin I may have used to be in, that I'm not bound up in the law, that I'm free to worship you in freedom and in truth, and I'm worshiping you wherever I am. It doesn't have to be a Sunday service. It doesn't have to be a Wednesday night. It's wherever we are, we have that freedom to be in worship Amen. constantly and consistently. We finally come to rest in Him, and we can bask in His presence. How much more freedom can you think of than to be in Jesus, moment by moment, day by day, in His presence? The fruits of the Spirit are free to flow in us. You know, that's what we're going to get to a little later, too, about the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are sometimes it's bound up because our flesh is not focused on the Lord. And so we're not, we don't have the freedom to receive. See, that's part of our relationship. When the Holy Spirit gives the gifts, gives us the fruit, and gives us all of the things that He promises us, we have to be focusing on Him to receive it. Otherwise, it's just it doesn't take effect. We can't really walk in that love and the joy and the peace and the, and the, the discipline, self-control and all the things that come along with it when we are not focusing on the Lord because otherwise we're focusing on self and we're focusing on self. It's always going to come back to what we want, what we, how we want people to treat us, how we want to feel. The emotional things come back in. Next thing you know, you're bound back up in emotionalism, you're bound back up in the law, or you're bound back up in sin because we weren't listening and allowing the Spirit of God to give us Number one, he gives us the freedom, but that freedom to receive all that he has for us. And we're going to discuss that more next week. But with our freedom comes responsibility and accountability. And that's a very, very important part of the freedom that God gives us. We can't use our freedoms to walk in the flesh and then rationalize it. 
that's a very, very, very difficult thing for sometimes for us to hear, and we have to really take a hard look in the mirror. Are we rationalizing our sin using grace? Well, God's grace covers it. Yeah, it does. But if the attitude of the heart is not right, when the conviction comes, there's a problem because we will find ourselves in a bad place. Romans 6, 1 through 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? And that comes back to the dying of the flesh. It comes back to dying of the spirit. When we're focusing, no, not dying of the spirit, dying of the flesh and dying of our self-will. When we're focusing on the Lord and we're focusing on his word, it is causing our flesh to die because we're replacing our desires for his desires. We're replacing what we want for his will in our life. And that's the direction that every Christian should be pursuing moment by moment is that less of me, more of him. Because that's ultimately what the greatest commandment means. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That doesn't leave any room for anything else, does it? All your might, all your strength, all your soul, everything about you, you're giving to the Lord. So if you're doing that, you're dying to yourself. That's where it begins. But when we find ourselves not focusing on the Lord, not loving Him, then the flesh gets back in the way again. It starts to resurrect again. And when that happens, the very next thing that will happen is then you'll begin to devour one another. Because only through the Lord can we love one another as ourselves. There have been many people who tried to get those backwards. Well, if I love my neighbor, that will bring me closer to loving God. No, it doesn't work that way. There's a lot of works that can take place in that. There's a lot of, sometimes there's some good things that can happen by helping your neighbor. And I don't discourage anyone by giving and helping your neighbor. But to truly love your neighbor as yourself, you have first got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't get those in reverse order. Otherwise, it's all about works. It's all about what I'm doing. And God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to be completely and totally uh, in relationship with him. Now, that leads me to the next point. We must not take our freedom and use it to beat up our brothers and sisters. And that's a sad thing that happens sometimes in the church is that we believe, oh, well, I'm set free from this, that, and the other, but other people may not be set free yet. Maybe they're still growing. Maybe they're still walking along in a place where God has got them where he needs them to be because he's working in them where they are. And the last thing that we need to do is because God set us free over here is to go grab somebody, shaking them. Oh, well, you need to do this and you need to do that. This is how God's going to deliver you. This is how God's going to do it. And their eyes get this big and they're scared to death because now they've done it all wrong. That brings them into bondage. Because we're telling them that they can only be healed, only can be saved, only can be relieved from whatever it is if they do it the way God did it in us. And that can, nothing can be further from the truth. Because everyone here and everyone that hears this message, they know people in their lives that, that we're all different. We're all different. God created us to be individualistic, but he also can, uh, can brought us to be all in love with him. That's what our purpose is. We lost that in the garden. Through Jesus, we get that back. We have that relationship now, but if we're putting our minds on what he did for us only, it becomes experiology. Well, my experience says this, and therefore it's got to be this way. No. Allow the Holy Spirit, who was the one who saved us, not man, allow him to do the work in salvation in others, allow him to do the work in healing in others, allow him to do the work in setting others free. We just be the messenger that God has called us to be in the way he's called us to be it. Not trying to bring people into bondage because our freedoms can be bondage to other people. Now, God's absolutes are absolutes, but he works those absolutes absolutely individually with us because he wants us all to hear how we can hear, to understand how we can understand. And my experiences may not mean anything to anybody. It may be an encouragement if it's told in a loving, kind, gentle way, but it's not to be a dictated, this is how it's got to be done. 
1 Corinthians 8, 9 says, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. And there's a lot of references regarding our liberty being a stumbling block. Some of it has to do with food. Some of it has to do with other legalistic things. But in general, anything that we, God has given us freedom in, let us make sure that that freedom does not mess with somebody else's relationship with the Lord. If my freedom might bring offense, then maybe I need to hold that back when I'm around certain people. Maybe I don't need to eat whatever. Maybe I don't need to, to drink whatever. Maybe I don't need to do this, whatever. If I have the freedom that I'm not, I don't want to offend them because they're not at that point. That's what loving others as yourself really means. It's to deny yourself. It's to let, let others have their freedom where they are and not let yours override them. And 1 Peter 2, 15 through 17 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now that was our scripture reading this morning. And I didn't know that was going to be our scripture reading when God gave me the message. This is, this is how God works. He brings his points together in unity. But we're to be as free, but not using our liberty as a cloak for vice, because it's very easy to say, well, I have the freedom to do so-and-so. And so, therefore, I'm going to do it. And actually, it's self-indulgence. It's not freedom. It's just denying the fact that God did not give you that freedom, but you're going to use what all the freedoms you have to try to get what you want. Our flesh is very deceitful. And there are many people today that will blame the enemy on everything when in reality the enemy can't make you do anything. As believers in Jesus Christ, we have the freedom to say no. We have the freedom to say, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. That's not God's will for my life any longer. We don't have to be bound up into the other things. We have that freedom. But many times people will say, oh, I'm so free that I'll practice this. And God will love me anyway, because I'm free. That's not what the Word of God teaches, and we, we see that in this verse here. Not as a vice. Bond servant. See, here's the, here's the interesting twist on this whole thing. He's talking about freedom, and he uses the word bond servants. The only way we can truly be free is to be a slave to Jesus Christ, a willing bond servant. To say, your will, not my will. I don't want to do what I want to do. I want to do what you want to do. I don't want there to be anything else in my life that's pulling me toward the flesh, the fleshly indulgent, the things of the world. I want all that gone. I want to walk in you totally, fully, as a bondservant. And in their time and in their day, a bondservant often was, um, was they were servants, they were slaves, and when their time was up and they were to be free. If they didn't want to go, they were pulled aside and they said, I want to stay with you. I want to live with you. I want to be your bond servant from now on. I don't want to just go out on my own. I like it here. And they would take them. They would take the, an auger and they would put it through their ear on the doorpost. And that was the mark that they were now bond servants for life. And they would stay there for life. Well, we should have the mark of Jesus Christ upon us. Amen. We are sealed. What does the Holy Spirit do? He seals us. We are have the seal of the Holy Spirit on us. We should walk as bondservants to Jesus Christ, willing to be a slave for him, willing to say your will above my will, willing to do everything he calls us to do and die to ourselves. And the greatest liberty that we have in Christ the greatest liberty we have is to love one another. Because without Jesus, it's next to impossible to love one another. Because somebody's going to make you mad. And somebody's not going to get forgiven. And somebody's going to walk in anger. Somebody's going to walk in bitterness. Somebody's going to walk in whatever because of what somebody else did to them. In Christ, the freedom that we have is to say, I forgive. And see, that's a commandment, too. Forgiveness is a commandment. How can we have a commandment to forgive in our flesh? 
Our flesh won't receive that commandment. But walking in the Spirit and walking in His liberty, we can come to the point to say, Lord, I may not feel this. <laughs> My feelings aren't quite caught up to the reality of what I'm supposed to do here, but Lord... I choose to forgive no matter what my emotions are telling me. May you die, these, may these emotions die, and may I really understand what true forgiveness is. And that's the beginning of the freedom that you have because not only are you forgiving them, you're actually releasing yourself. You have more freedom within yourself. You're not walking in bondage. And there have been many studies that have linked physical illnesses with unforgiveness. Addictions to unforgiveness. A lot of times things are rooted places that we don't even know they're rooted. We move on. We have something buried in our past and it takes the Holy Spirit to come to us and reveal what that is and show us you haven't forgiven. You need to do that. And when we do that, then the freedom comes. Now we may have differences on some points, but through love we're not bound up in arguments and dissension and backbiting. We're not bound up in the little things about paint on the walls and carpet on the floor and, and uh, who's doing this ministry and why am I not doing that? And, you know, we're not to compare ourselves to anybody else anyway. If you're doing what God's called you to do, walk in peace in that. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. And I've said this before too. If God calls you to do something and gives you the passion for it, don't expect everybody else to be as excited about it as you are. He's called you. He may not have called your, no, your brother or your sister. So walk it out what he's placed in your life to do, not worrying about other people because it sets you a whole lot more free when you are actually walking out what God's called you to do and not worrying about what other people are doing around you. We're bound in love toward first the Lord and then to one another. So we're called to what? Encourage one another. We're called to pray for one another. It's the second greatest commandment. Love thy neighbor as yourself. And this law, this law of love, is only fulfilled in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But it is fulfilled. And we have this freedom and this liberty. And it comes because we trust in God to give it to us. But it's so important that we understand that the minute we take our eyes off the Lord, the minute we decide we can do something better or we can do it on our own or that our ideas or our plans are more important than other things, that's the minute that our freedom is all gone and we're bound up now back into the fleshly stuff. And that affects the church. It affects the church in a hard, hard way. And many people leave in woundedness because of this kind of thing. But if we love one another through the liberty that we have through Christ, through the liberty that comes, through the love that he gave to us. When we walk out in that liberty, we're walking out in what he's called us to do, and he will bless, and he will make the fruit of that. It's not our place either to try to create fruit. Let him, he will lead us to whether we're to sow, he'll lead us whether we're to reap, water, whatever it is he's called us to do, but let him be the one who actually brings the fruit. Otherwise, you can get very discouraged in your walk as well because, well, I just hadn't seen any fruit. Just don't see things happening. Well, you don't see what God sees. He sees a whole lot more than we can see. And only when we see him face to face, we've left this earthly tent, and we're in heaven with him, will we see the fruit that he actually produced because we were willing to be used as a vessel. And that's going to be a blessing. It's going to be a blessing. I just encourage you this morning to walk out, stay on the path, don't vary. Going back to last week, no U-turns. Stay straight. Let Him guide you. Let Him lead you. But listen, pray, seek, knock, and depend upon Him for the freedom that He will give you to accomplish what He wants to do in your life, through your life, as He sees fit. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much. Lord, your freedom through love is something that we can't even really comprehend. Each one of us, Lord, when we're born into this world, are born into bondage of sin. 
And it only, come, it only leaves us, Lord, when we come into a relationship with you. But many times, and often it's, it's, it's an older age. A lot of people uh, don't connect with you until they're older than life. And all the habits and all the patterns and all the traditions and all the things that they may have been taught and everything about that, Lord, they're all bound up in that. And when they meet you, it's like, oh, I can't depend upon any of those things anymore. I can't rely on my denominational teaching if I went to church for many years. I can't rely on uh, what, what, what mom and daddy told me about, you know, if you go to church, you're okay. I can't rely on anything except my relationship with you. I'm only free when I receive you totally and fully in my life. And I choose to walk in that freedom. I choose to walk in, in the, the glorious liberty that you give us, Lord. But it's a discipline. It's, it's a discipline for endurance. May you give us the strength that we need, Lord. For those this morning who may be discouraged, I pray for them, Lord. I pray for the discouraged in heart. I pray that you would just right now speak to them and say, don't be discouraged but understand that where you are is where I've got you to be, and you're doing what I've called you to do. Don't quit. Continue in the race that God has placed upon your heart and your mind. Follow through. If you've fallen, stand up. May the Lord Jesus lift you up. May you be restored in the walk. May you be restored in relationship. May you not walk in the bondage of of guilt for whatever may have happened or is happening. I pray that the Holy Spirit even now would speak truth into your heart for anyone who's discouraged, for anyone who is, who is really sitting on a fence. There may be somebody right now just sense that there might be somebody sitting on a fence in their relationship with God that is being teased by the world just as Lot was when he cast his eyes what did he cast his eyes upon? He had the freedom to go anywhere he wanted to go. Abraham said, you choose. He chose, he chose Sodom. He saw it. He also saw the plains were watered. He saw all the things he thought was going to be good. First he saw Sodom. Then he moved toward Sodom. Then he moved in Sodom. Lord, I pray this morning that anyone who has found their way facing or sitting in the gate, or in Sodom right now, Lord, that you would open their eyes and that you would deliver them from that, Lord, because even as we speak now, this world and this culture is coming to an end. May we find that freedom in you in the midst of this ugly, awful world that we live in. But we have hope. We trust you. We praise you. We thank you. We recognize you as our strength. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.